All right, Bad M107 students, um, now we're going to finish off contracts, and then we'll be able to get on to employment law. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, we're at slide 117, and we're dealing with uh, contracts and the issue of jurisdiction, which means contracts uh, which may have been uh, negotiated across uh, uh, border, uh, particularly within Canada, because that's still a jurisdictional issue. So we're going to look at five different types of situations where a contract can be negotiated at a long distance. We're going to look at mail contracts. We're going to look at contracts concluded by courier, contracts done on the telephone, contracts done by facsimile, although used less and less so nowadays, and contracts done by email. Um, transaction in addition, the question is when does the contract come into existence? Uh, this is particularly important if it's necessary for the contract to be interpreted by the courts. In other words, one party breaches it and the other party commences a lawsuit. So if I have a contract with someone in Toronto, do I sue here or do I sue in Toronto? Because he's in Toronto and I'm here. So um, uh, jurisdiction is the province, state, or country uh, whose laws will apply to a particular situation. We're going to look at contracts concluded by mail. Uh, let's say I'm in Vancouver and I want to buy um, uh, peak performance pontoons and your, your uh, dealership is in uh, Ontario. So I send you an order for 100 of those at $1,000 per. Um, and I send it in the mail and I mail it um, today, which is um, April the 26th. And it takes uh, two days to arrive, so it arrives with you on April the 28th. And uh, you look at it, and you check your stock, and you check the type of skis uh, and the price, and you conclude that it's good. So um, now it's April 29th, and you write a letter back to me. Uh, well, April 30th, and uh, gosh, it's going to get here about May 1st. Does the contract come into existence when you put the a letter in the mail accepting my offer or does it get concluded when the letter arrives at my business and I go oh good he accepted my offer well the you would think it had to be ex yeah, arrive and, and and I have knowledge of it in actual fact the law is a little bit different when you're dealing by mail um, and this has come up in a number of cases over history and we'll talk about a few of those um, but the leading case out of England is Hanthorne versus Fraser, and the court said that the mail rule applies, or the rule of commercial convenience, as it's sometimes called in Canada. And it says that if an offer is made by mail, that's the first element, then acceptance occurs when a properly addressed stamped envelope is put in the mailbox in Toronto not when it arrives, okay? So I may be functioning for a couple of days not knowing whether or not I have a contract when in actual fact I do. Um, and the rule comes from the Post Act. Uh, Hanthorne versus Fraser is a <clears throat> English case, so it comes from the Post Act, which is a uh, um, UK statute, but we have the same here. And um, just think in, in terms of this, you're sending a letter to somebody and you walk down, and you put it in the post box and then you go, oh wait, I forgot to put in something in that letter that I meant to. Well, I'll just stand here and I'll wait until the postman comes. And, oh, hi, Mr. Postman, could I please have my letter back? Well, the answer to that will be no, okay? And the reason for that is once you put the envelope in the mailbox, the post office is the agent for the recipient. All right, so it is no longer your letter, it belongs to the uh, recipient, and the post office will not allow you to get it back. Um, that being the case, the post office act is acting as the offeree's agent. Well, agents can incorporate you into contracts, so the offer gets to you in Toronto, and you fill out your, your acceptance, and you put it in the post box, now the post box is my agent. Well, my agent can enter me into contracts, and so that con uh, acceptance, when it goes in the mail, has been accepted by my agent, okay? 
Um, this can cause problems because the fluctuation in price might mean that I made an offer and I want to get it back. Um, and so um, I said the letter gets to you on April the 28th and you answer on the 29th. What happens if on the 30th I go, oh, oh wait a minute, no, no, the price has gone down. Um, I want to revoke that offer. I'll just write another letter and I'll put it in the mailbox revoking my letter or my offer. So my letter goes into the post box on April the 30th. You've already put the letter of acceptance in the post box in Toronto on April the 29th. Do we have a contract? Um, well, you would say acceptance occurred before um, uh, revocation, and, and so obviously, yes, we do. Well, let's, let's look at it differently. Um, I send a letter to you on April the 26th, and it arrives on April the 28th. But on April the 27th, I realize, uh oh, <clears throat> the price has gone down. I want to revoke my offer. So I mail the revocation on April the 27th. So the revocation is in the mailbox to you in, Van in the box in Vancouver um, the day before you put the letter of acceptance in uh, the mailbox in Toronto. Well, it takes two days for my revocation to get there, and it takes two days for your acceptance to get to me. So my revocation arrives before your letter of acceptance, okay? Um, but wait, um, uh, gosh, how does that work? Well, obviously, um, you look back at the rule. It says when an offer is made by mail, acceptance occurs when the properly addressed stamped envelope is put in the mailbox. So acceptance occurred on April the 29th, right? My revocation went in on April the 27th, but... The rule doesn't say a revocation is effective when it goes in the mailbox. So my revocation, remember, um, revocation has to be made before acceptance. So the only way my revocation could be effective is if it got to you before you mailed your acceptance. So that's the mail rule from Hanthorne versus Fraser. It became law in Canada in a Supreme Court Canada case of uh, Charlebois versus uh, Burrill. Um, and then uh, the, the case of Loft versus Physician Services Inc. is an interesting one because it shows you how this can cause particular problems. There was a business called Physician Services Inc. and they wanted to hire a manager. Okay, they are physicians. They are good doctors. They are not good business people. So they want to hire a business manager for their clinic. They interview a lot of people and they want to hire Loft. Loft is up here. The rest of the applicants, yeah, you know, but Loft is up here. Loft lives in another town, so the physicians write him a letter and they make him an offer of employment. They offer him uh, free medical, surprise, surprise. They give the, you know, the wage, the starting date, um, and um, they say, and, and it's a very good offer because they say, we will pay for your moving expenses to move to our town and <clears throat> uh, we'll pay uh, the uh, cost of uh, the commission for buying a house. Really good offer. So Loft gets it and he goes, hey, look, sweetie, look, oh, this is wonderful. I got the job. Oh, there's a hugging and kissing going on. And it says in the letter, please respond uh, by your <coughs> with your acceptance by... Um, uh, return mail. So Loft writes out his acceptance and he puts it in an envelope and addresses it properly and you know and puts a stamp on it and the wife and the husband go down to the mailbox and they put it in the mailbox and then they go out for a very expensive dinner. Um, as it turns out the letter never arrives. No explanation by the post office. They they can't find it. It was never returned. So um, uh, as far as Loft knows, he has accepted the offer um, and he sells his house and he moves down and he buys a house and uh, then he walks in and he goes, hi everybody, I'm here. And they go, who are you? And he goes, well, I'm Loft, your manager. And Physician Services Inc. says, oh, well, we didn't hear back from you, so we've hired somebody else. Go away. Well, he's left a job, he's sold his house, he's bought a house, he's gone through the expense of moving and they tell him to go away. 
obviously there's a lawsuit here. So Loft sues and they get into court. And what the Canadian court said was, um, what we have here is two innocent parties. Okay, the court accepted all the evidence that said uh, Loft received the letter and responded exactly as required. They accept that the letter was put in the mail um, and then they look at Loft versus Physician Services Inc. And they accept the evidence that Loft, or that Physician Services Inc. did not receive the letter. Okay, so they say, well, what we've got here is two innocent parties. On the balance of probabilities, which party is the most innocent. And then they looked at Loft and they said, what did Loft do? Loft did exactly what Physician Services Inc. asked them to do. Okay. Then they look at, at Physician Services Inc. and they say, all right, you make an offer. Loft is the person that you want to hire. You do not hear back. So you just hire somebody else. Um, you don't pick up the phone and say, Hi, Loft, uh, are you not interested? Um, uh, that's one, one thing they didn't do. And the other thing they didn't do is if they wanted to hire someone else, they should have revoked their offer. But they didn't do that. And so out of the two innocent parties, Loft was the most innocent. And Loft was compensated. Um, <clears throat> okay, so... Uh, that's the mail rule. Uh, so I call you in Toronto and I say, uh, hi, um, I want to um, uh, order uh, 100 skis at $1,000 per ski. Um, and uh, you say, uh, uh, okay, let me, I'll, I'll think about that and I'll get back to you. And you check your inventory and you check the pricing and you say, yep, that's good. So you fill out a letter of acceptance, you know, <laughs> Put a stamp on it. You go down and put it in the mailbox. Right after you put it in the mailbox, I call you and I say, I revoke my offer. And you say, whoa, hey, no, come on. We've accepted it already because the letter's in the mailbox. Is there a contract? Well, what you do in a situation like this is you go back to the rule. First part, if an offer is made by mail, then the second part kicks in. Ah, but here... The offer was not made by mail. It was made by telephone. So you in Toronto, your letter of acceptance would have to arrive at my business in Vancouver before I revoke. But it hasn't. It's just gone in the mailbox when I call you. Okay, so revocation to be effective must be received before acceptance. Well, I communicated the revocation before acceptance because the mail rule did not apply. Okay, that's the, that's the first situation. The second situation is couriers, and um, we can see how many contracts are being concluded by couriers now with the uh, coronavirus. Um, so the courier, um, <clears throat> when an offer is made by courier and the acceptance uh, occurs when the acceptance is given to the return courier, so it's like the mail rule, okay? Um, and this came up in the uh, case of Regina versus Wentworth uh, product, C Products LTD. In the lecture materials, I've given you the two pages um, photocopied out of that case. And on the right-hand page, you can see a paragraph where the judge said uh, that, that he concluded that the rule of commercial convenience, which is the mail rule, should surely apply to career situations um, <clears throat> uh, just like the mail rule. All right. So I career you an offer and you career back your acceptance. Well, the second you give that letter to the career, the contract is complete. You have to be a little careful here, however, because if I mailed you an offer and you couriered back the response, that would not be effective until the courier arrived or vice versa. If I couriered an offer to you and you accepted by mail, the acceptance would not be effective until the letter arrived. Why is that? 
Well, go back to what the judge said. When an offer is made by courier, acceptance occurs when the letter of acceptance is given to a return courier. All right. Um, so mail rule, we know that the contract would be fought in Toronto under the courier rule. The mail or the, the court case would be fought in Toronto. Ah, who, like, who cares? You know, common law in BC, common law in uh, Ontario. Well, you're going to care because you're going to have to go all the way back there for the settlement conference. Then you're going to have to go all the way back there for the trial. And then if you win, you're going to have to go back to Ontario to try to ex levy execution, right? So it's a long distance and you want the, the contract to come into existence in Vancouver. Okay. Next slide, so we're on 118, uh, and we look at uh, the next three uh, ways. Telephone, okay, so I telephone you in Toronto, and I say I make you an offer to buy 100 skis at $1,000 per ski, and you say I accept. Where does the contract come into existence? Toronto, where you said it, or Vancouver, where I heard it? Well, if we go back to... Uh, let's see if I can find it quickly enough here without wasting too much time. Um, acceptance on P on uh, slide 91. Acceptance must be positive. Okay, I spoke it and it must be uncondition unconditional. But acceptance must be communicated, obviously, right? And so that being the case, um, the... Uh, Acceptance isn't effective until I hear it in Vancouver. Okay, I'm just going to grab that page again. All right, uh, so we're back to slide uh, 118. An instantaneous means of communications where acceptance occurs when the offeror hears the acceptance. Okay, so you say I accept, I hear it, that's where acceptance occurs. Any court case would be fought in, Tor in Vancouver, not Toronto. Facsimile. Uh, this is a little bit of a muddy situation uh, for, for a reason that I'll get into very quickly. And thank goodness uh, fax is used less and less so. However, um, there have been uh, situations where banks ask you to uh, respond by return fax. Okay, They don't like scan documents and email. They like fax documents for some reason. Um, anyway, uh, we're going we're gonna to deal with that very quickly. I'm in Vancouver. You're in Toronto. I fax an offer and you get the fax in Toronto and you do a return fax of acceptance is it effective when you send it or when I hear it ah we have to be careful because it, that doesn't apply is it accepted when you send it so it's Toronto or when it arrives in Vancouver because one of the things you'll see in this chapter at the beginning is um, when, when you're doing offers and acceptance, um, the, the general rule is that you should respond in the manner in which the offer is made. Why? Because I'm expecting a return fax. All right? So once you've done that, you've done what I've requested, just like in Loft versus Physician Services, Inc., um, and my fax goes, or your fax goes through to me, it does not matter whether I have read it or not. The contract is complete, and it's complete in Vancouver. Okay, um, so that's fax. When I was t telling my students this a few years ago, one of my, my very, I was going to say smart, but... Um, smart alecky is probably it. Students said, okay, Mr. Holden, but what happens if you put the, fa the paper in the fax machine upside down. So instead of getting a fax with the offer on it, I get a blank page. And, uh, you know, I said, uh, okay, you know, well, we're out of time um, because I, didn't, I had to think it through. And so I, uh, I said, we'll deal with that later. And I went home that night and uh, I'm sitting in my law office and my fax goes off and I go over and it's three blank pages and I thought oh <clears throat> that smart Alex student has gotten my law number and he sent me three blank pages you know just to see what I'll do 
Um, and then I noticed at the bottom, there was actually a number. Some of fax machines do that of where it came from. And so I thought, oh, it's an area code I don't recognize. So I looked in the phone book and the area code was Arkansas. I thought, who do I know in Arkansas? Well, Bill Clinton, but if Bill wanted to talk to me, he'd just phone. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, anyway, I didn't know anybody in Arkansas. So I faxed back, said, I received three blank pages. Please fax again. And the next day I got a fax from a law firm down there that said, uh, sorry, put the uh, letter in upside down. So it can happen, right? Um, <clears throat> and um, what it, it turned out it wasn't a lawsuit or anything, but it was a business down there, a uh, business person down there that had money and wanted to move to Canada. And we had this entrepreneurial Im immigrant program where you could come to Canada if you invested in a business. And so the question was, uh, what, do you have any clients that need money? No, none of my clients need money. <laughs> you know, all all businesses like to get, you know, investment when they can. Anyway, um, that got me to thinking, and I asked my business manager wife, you know, what would she do if she got, uh, you know, blank pages of facts through to us? And she said, well, I'd take them out and I'd put them in the um, uh, a file folder that we have with... Um, uh, pages that we use to recycle. So you take a, a page with something that's unimportant on it and you put it in, in the fax machine and then it prints on the other side, which is blank, and then you can save uh, paper and save money. And I thought, uh, you know, she'd say either that or I'd, you know, throw it out. And I thought, wow, what if there had been a lawsuit and they have a transaction complete that says we received it, my client's been served, he has, you know, it would be 63 days to file a defense and and uh, we don't know about it so we don't file a defense and the other side gets a default judgment so you really have to think about this in your law office if you do use fax machines what you want to do is have a system where blank pages are put on the manager's desk and then if there's a, a telephone number um, they can uh, contact that telephone number or if they're just blank pages then you make a note at such and such a time received you know, three blank pages, so they have a record, and then you can uh, you can deal with it later. For example, if a default judgment had been taken against my client, I could go to court and I could have a default judgment set aside, saying that um, we received these three blank pages. Okay. Um, all right. So facsimile. Um, uh, when an offer is made by fax, acceptance occurs once a return fax is sent, and the offeree has a transaction complete uh, printout. Okay, so on our uh, fax machine, we used to just periodically print out that all our faxes that we received and all the faxes that we sent, and then it would have a date whether it actually went through or not. And that way we could establish that we did communicate that, that particular correspondence to, who, uh, to the recipient. Okay, so that's facsimile. Um, then we have email. Uh, email uh, has not been uh, adequately judicially interpreted yet, so we're not exactly sure um, how the courts would respond, but it seems pretty clear that if I email an offer to you and you email your acceptance, um, your, your computer will say that it's gone through or it hasn't gone through, okay? So if it comes back and it says it has not gone through, well, obviously, you're trying to accept, right? So you would then do it again. Um, but if it is, if it has gone through, then where would the contract come into existence? This is like an instantaneous um, uh, method of communication. So in Toronto, on the phone, you said, I accept. In Vancouver, I hear, I accept. The contract comes into existence in Vancouver. In Toronto, you send an email of acceptance and arrives in Vancouver. It's a little bit like an instantaneous communications because it has been communicated instantaneously, so the acceptance will occur in Vancouver. Um, and it's like the fax machine. It does not matter whether I have accessed my email and read it or not, um, because like in Loft, um, I sent you an offer by email. You've done what I expect you to do, and that's respond by email, okay? Now, if I go back to that rule that you should respond in the manner that the offer is made, so if it's made by mail, you respond by mail, make courier, respond by courier, etc., etc., right? Um, well, look at the wording. You should, 
Okay, it doesn't say you must. It's not a legal rule. It's a business practice rule. Okay, so if I sent you a letter and I said I'll buy a thousand or a hundred pairs of skis at a thousand dollars per ski, um, per pair of skis, I should say, then um, and you will go, wow, that's great. He's actually paying a bonus for those skis. Um, I want to accept that, so I'm going to write a letter and I'm going to or draft a letter, give it to my, my secretary. She's going to type it up. I'll get it tomorrow. I'll sign it and we'll get it down to the mailbox probably tomorrow at 5 o'clock. I might revoke my offer by then, right? So what you want to do is you want to accept by a faster means. Okay, I mean, you could accept by a slower means. You could uh, uh, give you the letter to your uncle... Uh, Uncle's nephew, twice removed, happens to be going out to Vancouver to save the cost of a stamp, and then, you know, two or three weeks later, the acceptance occurs. I mean, that's silly, right? So you wouldn't accept in a manner, manner that was going to slow it down, usually. <clears throat> you might want to accept quicker. Well, you know, I receive a letter. I phone. Hi, uh, Peter Olden in Vancouver. I got your offer. I'm just phoning to say I accept, and we are in the process of uh, putting your uh, parcel together. All right? or your, your shipment together. So you can accept by a faster means or a slower means, but that just doesn't make any sense. Um, okay, so there's something else I was going to say about that, but I can't remember what it is. It'll probably come back to me. Um, all right, so now we know um, that there's this problem in uh, long-distance communications about um, what jurisdiction the contract comes into existence in. That's a pain, knowing all these rules, and um, uh, <clears throat> it's you know there's also it's fraught with some problems. So why don't we put a clause in the contract? Okay. So on slide um, one nineteen, uh, the solution, the risk management solution to this is uh, have your lawyer insert a clause in the contract. I give you a sample clause there. This agreement shall be deemed to have been made in the city of North Vancouver and the laws of the province of British Columbia shall apply, shall apply to, the exclusion of exclusion, to the exclusion of conflicts of laws. That in there resolves the problem. It came into existence in Vancouver. Okay, Whether you fax, whether you telephone, whether you courier, doesn't matter. The contract specifies it. Okay, So um, I send you a letter in Toronto, you get it, you accept. The acceptance may be complete in Toronto, but it's deemed to have been completed in Vancouver, so the court case will be fought in Vancouver and you will have an advantage. Well, that's long distance, eh? You know, whew, thank goodness if you're in North Vancouver and there's a business in uh, uh, downtown Vancouver, uh, you don't have to worry about all this. Well, yes, you do. Let's say um, I make an offer to you in Vancouver and you accept my offer, but you fail to pay. So I ship the goods to you and you fail to pay me. So now I have to sue you, but it's, you know, it's Vancouver, isn't it? Well, no, actually, there's a difference between North Vancouver and Vancouver. Because if the shipment is for $30,000, you're going to want to sue, I'm going to want to sue you, okay? And... I have an advantage that this the um, monetary limit for small claims court is $35,000, so I can sue you in small claims court, get some legal advice, but I can handle it myself, keep the legal expenses down. Well, I file um, a uh, notice of claim in the small claims registry in the courthouse, which is on uh, St. George's and uh, 23rd Street in North Vancouver. And I serve it on you in Vancouver, and I get a defense file that says lack of jurisdiction. Oh, no, 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 wait a minute. We're both in the BC jurisdiction, so what's this about? Well, Small Claims Court has uh, rules. Um, and one of the rules says the court case must be filed and dealt with in the court in the area of the city where the contract was to be performed. I think the contract is performed 
when you pay me. Okay? You think the contract is performed when I send you the goods. So we've got a problem here. Um, the contract between us is not clear as to what constitutes performance. Um, so we so that rule is unclear. We kick to the second rule. Okay, there's other rules, but we're just going to deal with the first two. The second rule is if you cannot determine where the contract is to be performed, then the, con the lawsuit must take place in the jurisdiction in which the defendant resides. That's Vancouver. Okay, big deal. North Vancouver, Vancouver. So I drive all the way across the bridge to the courthouse in Vancouver, and I file a notice of claim, and I serve it on you. And then I drive all the way across to file a reply to a counterclaim because you sued me back. Then I drive all the way across the bridge to the settlement conference. Then I drive all the way across the bridge for the trial, but they put a couple of things in the document so we don't get to our case that day, and I have to drive all the way across the bridge the next day. What's that, five so far? And I win. Yay, thank goodness. Now I have to drive all the way across the bridge to start garnishing orders or payment hearings or uh, search and seizure of assets and things like that. How many people like that bridge? Yeah, I don't. Okay, so um, even in Vancouver, for example, in metropolitan Vancouver, you want to have this clause in because it says the contract shall be deemed to have come into existence in, in North Vancouver and you, um, uh, you file in North Vancouver and then the other party has to drive across the bridge. Okay, now some of those things you can do by telephone. Okay, but remember what I said at the beginning of the year, I don't, I don't fight court cases by telephone and I would highly recommend that if you're doing this, you don't either. Okay, so that's transactions at a distance. The last topic in the chapter in the textbook, <clears throat> um, <coughs> pardon me, um, and on slides is um, options. Option agreements um, play a very important role in business. Let's say, for example, that uh, Jimmy Pattison, and for those of you who don't know him, he is a billionaire in Vancouver. Uh, who owns uh, car dealerships, um, he owns uh, Save-On Food stores, um, others that I, I don't even know about. So he's um, a very, very successful business person in uh, Vancouver. And uh, he, he wants to build another Save-On Foods. Now, if anybody has been in a Save-On Food store, they are huge, all right? They take up a lot of area. So he finds a place where he wants to open up a store and there are three lots that he must require or acquire. Uh, there's two lots, A and B, that are owned by different people and they're about $75,000 each. And then there's another bigger lot owned by uh, Mrs. C and it's $150,000. If Jimmy Pattison went to lot A and said, hi, I'd like to buy your lot for $75,000, Mr. A will say, oh, I'm sorry, the price has gone up to $85,000. Why? Well, it's illogical, but because they know Jimmy Pattison and they know he has lots of money, suddenly my lot, which is worth $75,000, suddenly becomes worth $85,000 because I want more, right? Um, but let's say the person doesn't know Jimmy Pattison, so he sells it for $75,000. Mr. B, who owns, owns lot B, thinks to himself, wait a minute, uh, this guy just bought lot A and now he's buying my lot. Suddenly he's trying to assemble land. He needs my lot. Okay. Or Jimmy Patterson manages to buy lot A and lot B and then Mrs. C knows, aha, he needs my lot as well. So suddenly that $150,000 lot goes up to $210,000. Well, Jimmy Patterson gets around that by calling his lawyer. Hello, Peter, this is Jimmy. Would you uh, do me a favor? Okay, <laughs> I wish. I wish he was my client. Um, for two reasons. Number one is uh, he's a very successful businessman, lots of legal work, and number two, he happens to be a fairly nice man, okay? <coughs> All right, so he he calls, uh, calls me up and he says, Peter, I need to buy those three lots. So what I'd like you to do is buy them for me. All right? 
And I say, oh, okay, Jimmy, how much have I got to play with? And he'll say, oh, $25,000. And I say, okay, so he sends me $25,000. I go to the fellow who lot owns lot B, or A, and I say, um, I'd like to buy the lot. Now, he looks at me, and he doesn't know me, okay? He doesn't know I'm working for Jimmy Patterson. I do not have to tell him. So his lot is worth somewhere around $75,000, so I say, I'll buy it for 65, and he says 75, and I say, okay, 70, and he says, uh, uh, or, or I say 70, and he goes, no, 75, and I go, okay, well, never mind. He says, well, okay, let, uh, let me think about it, 70. So I say, well, I'll tell you what. I will pay you $10,000 for the option to buy lot A. Um, if I, and, and I have to exercise my option within 60 days. So if I decide to buy lot A, you keep the $10,000 and I will give you another $65,000 and you've got your $75,000. If I don't buy it, you get to keep the 10 and you still have the lot to sell. So Mr. A says, oh yeah, okay. So I, he does that. Um, and then I go to lot or B, which is owned by Mr. B, and I make the same kind of offer, and he agrees, and I give him $10,000. Uh, <clears> and now I've got an option to purchase lot A and an option to purchase lot B. I go to Mrs. C, who owns lot C, and now she's heard something about me buying these lots up, and she thinks he needs mine too. My lot is now worth $210,000. And I go, well, thank you very much, and I shake her hand, except right now it would be sort of a virtual shake, okay, or something like that. But I say, thank you very much, uh, no. And I start to leave. And she thinks, oh, what's going on here? Uh, okay, okay, well, I'll, I'll sell my lot uh, for 150000 So then I buy her lot for $150,000. I exercise my lot, uh, option to buy lot B, and I exercise my lot to... To, option to buy lot A, and now I have the three lots. And then they go, hey, wait, no, no, no. Now we find out that you've just um, assigned those those uh, purchases to Jimmy Patterson. We, we want more money. Well, they can't, okay? So by using an option like that, you can protect yourself against um, uh, sharp practices, all right? Okay, so that's one way you can use options. Um, you can use it in even in family matters. And I'm coming back to my uh, mother-in-law, uh, Mabel, who incidentally liked to be called Sunny because she didn't like the name Mabel. So um, uh, Sunny um, inherited a lot on Bowen Island, a waterfront lot. Okay, She hated Bowen Island, she hated the lot, and she just wanted to get rid of it. Um, my wife, her daughter, said, um, Ma, because she called her Ma, uh, Ma, uh, never sell that lot without first calling us and, and finding out if we'd like to buy it. And Sonny said, oh, sure, okay. And I laughed. <laughs> and my wife, Kathleen, said, what, why are you laughing? And I said, well, because you know she's going to wake up tomorrow. And she goes, I hate that lot, and she's going to sell it to somebody. And then you'll say, Ma, I asked you to tell us. And she'll say, oh, darn, I forgot, right? So I said, <clears throat> uh, let's get her to sign an option. Um, and we'll pay her $100, and saying that she has to give us 60 days to decide whether we want to buy it or not if somebody else wants to buy it. And, um, uh, and uh, everybody thought that was crazy, okay. Um, but they did it. And so finally I got this agreement, this option done. And, um, and I, I got it done in registrable form, right? Now this is a contract between family members. And remember the rule that this is a non-arm's length transaction. And so in order to have it enforceable in a court of law, you have to go through the formalities. So I had the, the formal document done up. Not only that, but I had it so that you could register it at the land title office. And then we gave Mabel $100, and she signed the option agreement and gave it to us. <clears throat> and um, I, uh, 
I then said, okay, I'm taking you down to register at the land title office. And Kathleen said, why? And I said, well, okay, right now, what would happen if she um, woke up tomorrow and said, oh, I hate that lot, and sold it to somebody else forgetting that she had signed the option? Um, then we'd have this agreement that said we could sue her. I'm not going to sue my mother-in-law, okay? So it would be totally ineffective. But if we registered at the land title office and somebody else, uh, and she makes uh, a deal with somebody else to buy it, that person will not be able to buy it until our option is removed from the uh, land title office. That's exactly what happened. We moved back to uh, Ottawa uh, working. You'll recall that I said that at the beginning of the term. We were back, th we were back there for um, uh, you know two years, and it looked like we were going to stay back there. Okay, And uh, all of a sudden we get a call from a lawyer who said uh, um, uh, Mabel had woken up and decided to sell the lot and they had made a deal with this lawyer's client and he said you've got an option on the lot what do you want to do about it so that meant there's no way she could actually sell the property without us first having an opportunity to buy it so that's a really good use of an option right um, now <laughs> we we're back east like I said we thought we we're gonna stay back there this lots way out here it's quite expensive and so we very foolishly <coughs> that's me shooting myself in the foot um, decided not to buy it. All right. So we, we let our option expire. Somebody else bought the lot, and that's the end of the story. But the option agreement at least protected us in doing that. Okay, so that concludes um, the Chapter 3 on contracts. And I just wanted to mention once again that we have um, in the back of, or in the back of each chapter in the textbook, questions. Um, which uh, you should look at to see if you have the ability to answer them or not. Um, so let me see here. Um, okay, arm's length transactions. I'm crying out loud here. Where are we? Restrictive covenants. All right. So on page 140, it starts, um, and for example, there are, the first question is, list of the six binding elements of a contract. So you would go, okay, offer, acceptance, consideration, intention to create legal relations, uh, legality of object, and capacity. All right, bingo, you've answered it. Now, that's good um, if you do it, um, but there will be questions that you answer and you're not sure whether they're correct or not. Uh, we don't have the ability easily to deal with that in an online uh, scenario like this. And so what I am telling you is that you can answer those questions, as I mentioned in the first introductory lecture, send them to me, and I will not answer them, okay, or check them rather, but what I will do is send you my answers, Okay, then you can sit down and you can look at your answer and you can look at my answer. And I do that for two reasons. Number one is it facilitates it easily enough. And number two, if you do it yourself, it'll be better than if I just said, uh, you know, this is the answer, you know, and corrected yours. So you look at it and you go, oh, okay, now I understand. Or you say, oh, uh, I still I still don't know this this thing. And so then you can email me and I can respond to your question, okay? There is a high degree of uh, correlation between uh, doing the assignments that I recommend that you do and doing the questions at the end of the chapter and your final grade in this class. Now, if you don't care, you wanna scrape by, you know, get a, get a D, uh, then, you know, that's up to you. But I, I always assume that my uh, students are striving to not only get a good letter grade, but to learn the material. So one of the best ways to do that is do the questions at the end of the chapter. All right, so that finishes off um, the uh, uh, chapter number three on contracts. Uh, the midterm exam will be on the risk management material, chapters one, introductory to legal system, and chapter two, torts, and chapter three, contracts because that is a massive amount of information which is relatively new to students. Um, so that'll be the midterm exam. 
Um, we are going to, in the next video, start on uh, employment law. Uh, that's chapter four, but you have to realize that we'll be doing that before we do the midterm exam, and yet chapter four will not be on the midterm exam. It will be on the final. If you have any questions with respect to what is on the exam, you just go to the lecture schedule, which is posted to eLearn. It says midterm exam on such and such a date, and it will tell you the chapters. Final exam, last day of classes, and it tells you the chapters. All right, thank you very much.